I want to welcome everybody to the October session of our Grand Rounds for the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Uh, before we get started uh, with our actual uh, Grand Rounds uh, presentation, just a couple of um, quick announcements. Um, October is the time of year when we often have new faculty uh, starting, and I see that Dr. Jesse Roberts uh, just popped up on my screen. And Dr. Roberts is going to be an orthopedic oncologist uh, based at um, Children's in the SCCA um, slash um, UW Medical Center. And then we also have Dr. Katherine Schroeder, um, who um, goes by either Dr. Schroeder or Kat. And Dr. Schroeder is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon who, um, of course, is going to be based at Children's and she will be practicing general pediatrics, but will have a focus on taking care of children with cerebral palsy. Um, so welcome Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Roberts. Um, we have um, just one uh, kudo this morning. It's very succinct. Um, it was passed along to me by Dr. Tatesman, and it's from an anonymous patient comment, and it says, X-ray people were good, Dr. Pace, Casey Peak was good. Um, that's all it says, and that pretty much says it all. So um, thank you, Dr. Peak. Um, I'm sure that good really means that you were as excellent as usual. We're fortunate to have Dr. Denise Dzinski uh, today for our grand rounds. Dr. Dzinski is the um, chair, uh, professor and chair of the Department of Bioethics and Humanities. And she's also the chief of the medical ethics consult service for UW Medicine. Um, I have uh, been fortunate to have worked with Dr. Dzinski on some formal um, academic committees, as well as some search committees. And I can tell you that whenever I think I really have thought about all the nuances and details of whatever issue we are discussing, um, Dr. Dr. Duzinski always um, has some nuanced um, take on the topic that I had not thought of. Uh, so we're uh, very fortunate to have her today, and I'm sure she's uh, going to give us some um, insight into uh, the ethics uh, in the era of COVID-19. So thank you, Denise. Thank you so much, Dr. Chansky. Um, I know many of you don't know me, and um, my last name is hard, so you can feel free to call me Denise. Um, so I think I'm going to just share my screen. Um, there we go. All right. Let me just move this, and I think we're going to go. I'm going to go off um, my video and run through these slides, and I'm hoping we'll have plenty of time for Q&A um, at the end and for discussion of a little case if we want to. So let me do all of that. Um, hold on. Okay, great. Um, all right, uh, let's see, there we go. So, um, so I want, oops. I want to thank all of you for having me here today. Um, I just want to give a little sort of orientation to what we're often doing in ethics. So, because people kind of have different ideas about what we're doing. Um, um, we are involved in the, in the healthcare sector. We are basically involved when there are particularly complex um, ethical issues. So. We're almost never involved in when it's something that's very obvious, like some kind of misconduct. That's not when we get involved. We're, we're, we're really involved when competent, caring, reasonable people may disagree about the best course of action. And certainly, certainly where COVID-19 is concerned, that, that, that is occurring, especially because so many justice issues are arising and there's almost always multiple ethically justifi justified ways of addressing things like health disparities or um, uh, distributive justice. So what I'm going to do today is there's no way that I could talk about every single ethical issue in COVID. I'm hoping to give you a little bit of 
sort of the insights that come from when you're looking at this issue from my perspective as an ethicist. And then we can drill down into a couple of specific um, examples. Um, and then we can certainly have a discussion more generally. I have a little case and we can use that at the end if it's helpful. Um, otherwise, we can just talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So the first and most important ethical issue um, and value is altruism, which is a core tenet of the practice of medicine and everything in healthcare. And it is certainly what is driving um, all of you to come to work every day under these difficult circumstances. And I just cannot thank you enough for the sacrifices that you are making for the well being of all of us. Um, we are so fortunate to have all of you um, taking care of us and our loved ones, but altruism comes first. And so thank you must come first and come last. So when we think more broadly about why do we expect healthcare providers and first responders to sort of risk their lives in this pandemic, especially when we think early on when we had even less information. Um, so, you know, they have families too. Where does this come from? And this is an ethical duty, what we call a duty to care, um, duty to, there are various different forms of how we describe this duty, but duty to care comes up often. And this is essentially a promise that those of you in healthcare are making to the general public to provide this special skill to those of us in need, because without you, we would m be very disabled or die, basically. So it's this promise that comes with the profession itself. Um, because so few in our community have the skills that you guys have, then those skills aren't transferable. And that's even more the case when we think about surgery, any type of surgery. So we can't, somebody from family medicine can't just drop in to the surgical suite and do what you guys do. So, so you're more rare in terms of the number of people who, who have the skills that many of you have, and then we can't really transfer you out as easily. So there's a preciousness about what you bring to bear that we have to keep in mind as we, as we think about this duty to care. But, but there's a notion and an understanding that healthcare providers uh, voluntarily assume some risk knowing that they will need to help in emergencies such as these. There's a corollary duty, however, for the healthcare providers to be protected. Um, and this is basically UW Medicine, the hospitals you're working in, wherever you're working, we have to figure out ways to make sure that you are protected to the best of our ability. And certainly in COVID-19, that became ex extraordinarily important. One important ethical issue that arose has to do with um, did, you know, did we have enough PPE to protect you adequately? Testing is another example. So early in, when, you, when you think about the duties early in the pandemic, surgeons in, gener in general identified as their key priorities. First, the need to maintain emergency surgical capabilities. Second, to protect and preserve the surgical workforce. And third, to fulfill alternate surgical ro roles within the team or non-surgical roles on redeployment. So that's you know, a, an elaboration of your duty. And given that commitment, um, uh, we, we always wanna ask, are we doing as much as we possibly can given the limited resources to make sure that you are as protected as possible in caring for health, uh, our patients? But of course, that's balanced. And I think this is sort of where we've been living lately. Since we got through that first big surge, very scary circumstances, we're now dealing a lot with this balance between the duty that all of you have and your well being and health, including the people who count on you outside of your work environment, like your family. family. So, some of the things I'm sure you can think of more is, um, you know, for example, surgeons right now are spread thin. How long can or will this go on? There are greater expectations for surgical specialties now given the economic imp impact, as well as the delay in being able for some of our patients to be able to get in um, during that period of time where we, we stop doing elective surgeries. Um, and that's a, lot, that's a lot for you guys to hold. Um, and there's a lot that comes with that. For example, 
many of you have may have children at home parents usually especially women need more support if you're going to come in and have to do surgery and do your do your work you might need more support at home um, um, training interests right especially when we we had a pause there in some of the procedures are residents and fellows getting the, the education that they need so that moving forward we can maintain our workforce um, and then of course there's this move to telemedicine i'm sure you guys use it somewhat but i don't think there's any telesurgery um, and so that puts you guys um, on the front line in a way that maybe other specialties don't have to be just based on a uh, specialty area. Um, and then there's this issue of redeployment. If we are overwhelmed again with another surge with severely ill COVID-19 patients, there may be, we may need to redeploy you um, to do other things um, outside of orthopedic surgery and sports medicine in order to help the critically ill. And that's again, because you have special skills that really are rare. Um, we can't find them anywhere, but this has, I'm sure this is a lot each day. I should say from my own standpoint, I work a lot, a lot, a lot with ICU clinicians, um, but less with orthopedics. Um, so I know I won't have a full understanding of your work day and your work life. And so feel free to, um, as we have a discussion, educate me. Um, and I hope I'm enough on track to be helpful today. So one of the key things that changes when we're in a public health crisis like we're in now is that the very found ethical foundation that we're standing on shifts. So in our usual standards of care, um, we, it's very respect for autonomy focused, patient, individual patient focused. We're trying to maximize the benefit to each of, our, each of your patients based on what you have to offer. And we often have a lot to offer each patient. Um, there's a fidelity and allegiance to each one of our patients. Um, I'll do what's best for you. And in this circumstance, always, um, not all who could benefit receive treatment, but this is due to lack of access or insurance. And now when you look at a public health crisis, in particular, should we get to the point where in crisis standards of care, which we all hope dearly we won't, but it's important to, I think, think ahead to what might happen and what we need to do there. Um, so in a public health framework, you're really look, looking not to the individuals who are in your care only, but also to the common good. So there's a real shift from focusing on the individual to focusing on a bunch of people, many of whom you've never met, who might need your services, but you, they, you, they aren't in your care yet. There are fewer, there's less autonomy for practitioners. There, you, you're gonna have to say no to some stuff that you would normally say yes to. Of course, the easy example is when you were not able to do some elective surgeries for a period of time where you would normally have said, of course, let's do those surgeries. And that might've led to disability and other kinds of things that you don't want for any patient, but we had to do it under those circumstances. And our goal is really to maximize the benefit to the greatest number of people. And there's a ton, a ton of attention on allocating scarce resources responsibly. And this is a scary endeavor because for example, when we were reprocessing PPE and when we are conserving PPE, people really worry, do I have enough to be safe and to keep my patients and my family safe essentially? Um, and here, not all who could benefit receive treatment, but this is due to scarcity. So in both scenarios, not everybody's gonna get what they deserve and what they need, but um, for different reasons. I think the thing that's happening now that's particularly challenging is we're trying to sort of balance both of these. Sometimes we're leaning more toward, let's focus on the common good, and other times we're really more focused on the day-to-day, -day, what can I do for my patient? And so that can make this stage, this liminal stage that I hope we're in for a long time before we can get completely out of it, it can make it even more challenging. What do I do? Wh which way do I lean um, under these circumstances? So, but this transition, if we have to make a full transition, if we are again, um, have a surge that requires us to really close things down or um, for, for a short period of time, or um, uh, we're really overwhelmed in the ICUs, for example, it's gonna be extremely difficult for practitioners to switch completely to this other 
this other ethical orientation it because you've been trained to do it the the in the usual way um, you'll have fewer so, uh, choices and you're going to have to say no when you want to say yes and it will often feel wrong because you're not able to do what's best for the person you're caring for but overall because of those resource constraints it's actually ethically right because of the scarcity but it's really hard to see that in the moment and it's really hard for people to shift to this new uh, public health orientation um, in general here what i'm always talking about is uh, our is some aspect of social justice and here i'm going to define distributive justice and health equity but i want to point out from the beginning that there it is impossible to separate these two if i'm talking about distributive justice i'm also talking about health equity and vice versa because in the realm um, so these two things are really intertwined because the allocation of resources must abide by fair rules of distribution and those rules can't be capricious so if there are deep inequities predating or influencing the distribution of these scarce resources the principles of distributive justice come under scrutiny and that's exactly what we've seen happen um, with COVID-19. Some people will think the, the plan for distribution is fair and equitable, while others will not. Um, and attending to that is, is part of my job and a lot of other people's jobs here. So when we talk about distributive justice, what I'm talking about is the fair distribution of benefits and burdens among members of a society. And what, what's, what's important here is it's not only benefits, it's also the burdens that come along with um, distributing um, our resources uh, appropriately and fairly. And we're gonna look at some examples here. Um, so I also wanna give you an overview of what we're talking about here when we when ethicists are thinking this through because essentially when we're rationing and in that is not a bad word um, that's just the shorthand for allocating extremely scarce resources um, uh, we we have a different different things that guide us so under these public health emergency circumstances one of our goals is to maximize benefit in ethics we call this a utilitarian orientation you're trying to save the most lives um, or save the most life years that second one is controversial but we certainly want to save the most lives so our the first way we allocate and the reason for example we stop doing elective surgeries is because of that commitment to maximizing benefits and saving the most lives we also want to treat people equally. And this one's hard, especially as we also confront uh, racism in our society in a way that from at least some of these, the generations on this call, we haven't done, um, we, have, we haven't seen before as a broader society. Um, so we wanna treat people equally, but mm, that's even tricky. What does that exactly mean? How do we do that fairly? Especially because when it comes to access to healthcare, people don't enter our system as equals, right? Some people have more advantages than others. So how do we account for that in emergency circumstances? One thing we know for sure is that a first come first serve allocation scheme shouldn't be used. What this essentially means is what you're trying to do is make sure that those who have the most resources can get to us fastest and if we just give away everything that we have, that's, you know, ICU beds, et cetera, et cetera, um, solely based on who shows up first and not based on other criteria like how sick they are or other things, then we're going to end up um, uh, uh, not honoring the first principle of maximizing benefits and saving the most lives. So sometimes random selection might be used um, when we have we're, when we're selecting among patients with similar prognoses, and we basically there's no reason to choose one over the other. They're they're equally likely to to um, let's say recover after uh, some some time in the ICU. We we might need a random selection to make our decision. 
The other thing that's really dominant as we think about vaccine allocation um, and really allocation of a lot of these resources is, is promoting, promoting instrumental value. So what this means is healthcare providers, for example, and others, but we'll just use you guys as an example. If we keep you healthy, we end up keeping a bunch more people healthy because we need you to keep those other people healthy. So this is a form of protecting the workforce, but there's an ethical justification to it that we call instrumental value. You're instrumental to the well-being of other people, so we have to protect you. Um, and, and I won't go into retrospective or prospective, you can see there. But um, the other thing that we also look at often is, you know, should we be prioritizing people who are the sickest or who are, the, who are worse off? What priority should they give in a system where they may not have fair access unless we do something actively to make sure that they have that access? Um, okay, so now I want to talk about health equity or health care equity. So um, we often talk about health equity, which is important. We often distribute health care here. Um, and the social determinants of health have, uh, are, are extremely important in somebody's health overall. And in fact, health care plays actually a small role overall. Things like education, um, safety in the home, you know, having um, nutritious food and water, et cetera. Those things often are, are even more important to somebody's health. But once they come to us, we're distributing health care. And now we want to help them no matter how how they got sick, right? And so health equity is a form of justice. It's, it's the absence of avoidable, unfair, or remediable differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically, or by other means of stratification. It implies that ideally everyone should have a fair opportunity to, to attain their full health potential and that no one should uh, be disadvantaged from achieving this potential. So you might have seen uh, a graphic like this before, um, but if the, if the goal is to get an apple, some will need more than others to reach that goal, all right? The tall person doesn't need as much, let's say, as the person who is the shortest on this graphic. So equity sees this disparity and addresses it, like you can see on the right-hand side, um, rather than settling for everyone having an equal share. It looks like everything's fair often if we just hand everybody the exact same thing. But in fact, overall, you can see from this graphic that may not be true based on whatever goal we're, we're trying to achieve. So, and we also know, for example, that a major contributor to health inequity, among other things, is racism. And we're seeing how that's playing out as we, as we try to examine allocation in COVID-19. So to give you a sense, if the goal's fair allocation, you can see how things might look differently, whether you're standing in a more privileged position or in an underserved position, right? So in a privileged position, you might have a doctor's note for testing even early on. Um, you could easily get to drive through testing. You just took your car there, no problem. The, restricting, the restricted visitor policy, if you had somebody who was sick in the hospital, is difficult, but it's understandable. Um, it's still difficult. This is maybe one of the most challenging things I've heard from staff um, ethically in terms of moral distress, but it's still cognitively we can understand what this, where this is coming from. And then you can social distance, for example. Many of us can, can do that, can work from home, keeping us safer. Um, and you might be proficient in English. Underserved um, communities might not have access to a doctor, so couldn't get testing or couldn't get some of the healthcare resources they needed to be as well as possible. They might not have a car for drive-through testing or there may be limited testing in their neighborhood. So for example, um, we are, I know, um, providing, doing some outreach to some of the communities, but some of the mobile outreach vans and stuff that we're doing can only um, accommodate about 200 people a day. And that means that a whole bunch of people in neighborhoods that are underserved aren't getting what they need. It's good that we're, we're all doing this and more people should be doing it. I'm all for it, but 
it still doesn't meet the need. Um, uh, and for the underserved positions, visitor policies, while understandable cognitively, like we said before, may exclude essential advocates or the key people that are needed to make decisions. So make, in, in some communities, people make decisions and in some families, they make decisions together. This idea of one person standing alone doesn't make any sense. In addition, if this environment, our hospitals, feel hostile to particular people, they may want more of their family members there to advocate for them on their behalf. Um, people in these communities may live in close quarters and they have to go to work, putting them at higher risk. And limited proficiency may be a barrier or um, in these circumstances, just to give you a sense of how things might look in different, in different circumstances. So um, you can see here the distributive justice issues are, there are many. Um, I'll just touch on a couple. Um, we touched on testing already. And we were certainly dangerously low on PPE early in the pandemic. Um, adequate PPE protects healthcare providers as well as patients. And if we don't have enough, all of those people are at risk. So this reprocessing or reuse need to, needed to come into play for reasons we'll talk about in a bit in a minute. But the the effectiveness of that PPE is essential to thinking through what is owed healthcare providers under these extraordinary circumstances. The next thing we might wanna talk about is triage. So uh, often we're in this pandemic, we'd be triaging ICU beds and all that come with that, all of the care providers who, who come with an ICU bed. Um, so multidisciplinary teams are charged with allocating those beds and the triage uh, process itself invo involves both the caring the team who's caring for the patient to help delineate whether they are in the sort of inclusion or exclusion criteria for, for proceeding to an ICU bed or a vent or non-invasive ventilation um, or not. And then um, we, we'll talk in a little bit more depth about what happens if, if we have to dig more deeply into triage. Um, ICU or surgical care is also, of course, allocated and rationed under these circumstances. We've seen remdesivir also rationed, uh, where now it's available to everybody with a COVID-19 diagnosis who's in the hospital. Um, but that can be, um, now, now the question becomes, will we have enough? Can we afford to buy the medicine for all the people who might need it in our, in our hospital? And then we'll talk a little bit in more depth about vaccine and how that's allocated. So here, just a couple of days ago, the National Academy came out with their basically final recommendations for vaccine allocation. And this is assuming, of course, we have the, also have the issue of, will some of the initial vaccines that come out be efficacious? Will there be more side effects or um, downsides than we would, we would want? I'm, I'm, for the moment, gonna consider allocation for vaccines that we have determined definitively are effective. Right, so here you can see we go back to instrumental value as being a driving force in that first line of the first priority group, and that includes frontline healthcare workers, people who work in healthcare facilities, first responders. A lot of people who are in our community here would go first, and the estimation is this is about five percent of the population. Um, then you see people coming in with comorbidities and underlying conditions, um, advanced age. Uh, we certainly see dramatic data that says once you are over basically the age of 60 or 65, the uh, likelihood of having severe disease goes up like 200 times up to 800 times when you get into your 80s. Then we have the next um, uh, group would be teachers, child care workers, food supply people, basically essential other essential workers. And then they move to young adults, children at, and, and uh, teenagers at universities, hotels, banks, gyms, et cetera, those who are at moderate, moderate risk, and then everybody else. Um, and as you know, there's no possible way we will have enough vaccine for everyone, even in just the United States. Um, 
early on. This will have to be phased in and it will probably take a year or more for everybody to get vaccinated. Um, we talked a bit, a bit about this, but one important ethical issue that plays in at all times is this restricted visitor policy. It feels like you're abandoning people and it feels terrible, especially when they're, they're alone and suffering if they have COVID-19. Um, and, and the only reason we're doing this is of course to prevent the spread of this infection. Um, and as soon as these can be relaxed, they will be. Nobody wants to have this visitor restriction. And at the same time, if we don't, it's highly likely that more people will become infected just by coming to the hospital, which is something I think we have a social responsibility to prevent to the best of our ability. So we're in that tension, like I talked about before, between doing what's best for the individual patient, not abandoning them, and doing what's best for these people that we haven't even met, but we need to make sure that they're safe. So for just a second, this is an old slide, I'm just using it for the, for the effect. Um, but imagine that there's another significant surge and that all of these green dots start to blow up. Um, what's gonna happen then? Um, I, I don't know how much of this you guys went over earlier on, but I'm just gonna review if you've had it before. The key thing we're always looking at are these distinctions between conventional, contingency, and crisis capacity, and they are all dependent on resources. And this includes, and maybe mostly, it involves human resources as well as stuff, right? Um, so if we're in our conventional capacity, we just go about as usual. We do conserve, it would be irresponsible not to, um, and we do sometimes substitute one thing for another, but we, we do this in a way that generally it, it, it looks like regular standards of care. Nothing's ever any different. In contingency, which I, I think it's fair to say we are in now, so depending on the resource, we might be in conventional contingency or even crisis. But I think in general, we're kind of operating in contingency, contingency doing everything we can not to get to crisis. Here, we have to do more conservation, more substitution and adaptation, and reuse is required. And it's ethically required because the implications of running out of something like PPE are far worse than um, reprocessing or reusing some of, the, um, some of the resources that we have now. And of course, um, once we get into a crisis standard of care, and crisis capacity, we're in a much more dire situation where we may not have enough even to meet the needs that I just um, described in contingency. So the primary goal um, is to prevent or limit the amount of time in, crisis, in our crisis. Um, by far, that's all we're trying to do, stay in contingency. Um, so we do that by conserving things, substituting things, and adapting, and you can see examples of each of those there. So we talk about this in terms of space, staff, and stuff, um, but I'll say supplies here to be a little bit more formal, but space, staff, and stuff. So what are we conserving? Conserving. We were trying to make sure there were enough um, procedure rooms, right, and ICU beds, and so we were converting to negative airflow rooms. Um, to make sure that we could take care of an influx of COVID-19 patients. Um, we're trying to protect our workforce by maybe making testing a priority and making sure that they have what they need to stay as protected as possible. We may need to train and deploy staff in areas outside their regular domains. Um, and this would apply to, of course to many of you where, where you have the skills, even though you don't use them every day necessarily, to perhaps help out in the ICU in a way that others may not have those skills. And then of course, we keep talking about PPE because it is kind of the most central and important thing in a lot of ways. So what would happen if we actually did run out of staff, beds, ventilators, or something? We would actually receive guidance from incident command at UW leadership. This is usually uh, announced at the, either the state level or the regional level. And then triage teams throughout the region would go into effect. 
And so what would start to happen is instead of thinking just in terms of our own hospital or UW Medicine, hey, where, where do I transfer the patient? Is there a bed available? We're now looking regionally. So all of our hospitals are coordinating. Who has a bed to take this patient? Um, and we know about each other's um, bed availability, for example, so that we can just send patients where they're likely to be able to be received instead of getting backed up. So we're co coordinating much more at the regional and at the state level. Um, uh, okay. So, and I will pause here to say, if and when that comes, this does not mean that every single person that we see who could benefit from our help doesn't deserve our care. This isn't about deserving. Rationing is never about who deserves a resource. It is only that we don't have enough for everyone who deserves it. And now we have to make the most painful choices that we'd ever have to make. So we'll continue to care for every patient who does not receive the resource. And we care about every single patient. We just definitely don't wanna speak in terms of who deserves something because it's not what that, this is about. Um, so for example, um, the, what, what I've read about your, your specialty is, of course, total joint arthroplasty was delayed. Um, and I imagine that was due in part to patient safety. Um, so, so the concerns then with, this, with de this delay is that you might contribute to disability, right? People might have more time to become disabled and not have that hip replacement. And there may be comorbidities and even death from those from those um, delays. And that, of course, is a huge concern. We were at first really focusing a lot on COVID-19 patients, but basically everything that I've described to you applies to any patient who's in our hospital, right? So if we're allocating things like ICU beds um, uh, carefully, that would not only be for COVID-19 patients, but cancer patients and trauma patients and everybody, we'd have to do some careful evaluation about who should, who, who can receive the, that, who's likely to benefit most from those resources. So early on, also the Journal of the American College of Surgeons put out um, sort of a general guideline for how to make these decisions about who receives care um, and who doesn't in these uh, liminal in this liminal state where we're not entirely sure, um, you know, how much capacity we might have or how dangerous it would be for patients to come in for more elective procedures. And so this is how they, they sort of looked at it. And you can see that you're looking at that utilitarian concern, harms benefit. You're looking at the risk to personnel. We always care about that. And then we're looking to, um, utilize real, uh, uh, resources responsibly. Um, okay, I think I already mentioned this, but what we would say here is that at UW Medicine, somebody from Incident Command would tell us. We would never flip to starting to provide um, care at a crisis standard of care without this declaration. Although people felt like that was exactly what they were doing and they were right to some degree um, here and in other places like New York. So here is one of the diagrams. This was one of the early diagrams for tri how triage would look for orthopedic surgeons. This was early in the pandemic. So you can see um, there are a lot of algorithms like this out there to help people distinguish between um, those who need emergent care, those who can wait, and those who um, are more, urgent, more urgently need help. So I wanna talk a little bit, if this were to happen, about triage teams. So the key thing is that triage teams are set up so that the bedside clinician caring for the patient is not asked to make allocation decisions for their patients. They just say, my patient really needs this, I, I want to advocate for my patient to get it. And then this multidisciplinary triage team will try to make decisions about how, who goes where, um, right? Uh, and who gets a ventilator or ECMO. 
So these triage teams are made up of um, senior clinicians, doctors and nurses in critical care, emergency medicine, trauma surgery, and then there's a designated lead, lead triage officer. There's at least one ethicist, and then specialists are called in as needed, depending on the circumstances of the patient. Now, there's a lot of back and forth talking about whether the triage team should be anonymous or known, right? If they're anonymous, it, there are advantages there, right? Because they're helping out in such a way that they are not getting so close to what's happening at the bedside that they can make a more sort of, um, uh, I don't know, I don't know, a decision that's really based on those algorithms and not based on the care and concern that comes when you're caring for a patient. But on the flip side, if the clinicians who need the triage team's help don't know them and aren't able to reach out to them for help even before that final decision needs to be made, how much use are they? So this is something that you know people debate. How much should this triage team be involved or known to the group? So just to give you a sense, in Western Washington, we work through the Northwest Healthcare Response Net Network. So a bunch of our hospitals and healthcare um, facilities are working together in order to use the same allocation scheme. So you can see here, this is about screening patients for um, adult or for ICU level care. And, um, and you can see what, what people would be looking for. And the most controversial is that last bullet this notion of how do we assess what frailty is and will this allow discrimination to come into um, the allocation so that people with disabilities or other comorbidities are gonna have less of a chance. And since, for example, we know that people, uh, black, indigenous, and people of color may be, may be more likely to have those comorbidities, are we essentially discriminating against those groups, disabilities, and others? Um, you can see here that we have, um, let me move this thing because I can't see the top of the slide. Um, this is the inclusion criteria for the ICU. So you can take a look here. These are constantly being tweaked, um, but this is what would guide us. And then here's an algorithm. Oops, like the, here's an algorithm like the others that give people just a general sense how to move through this. Do they meet criteria? Yes, no, admit to the floor, et cetera that help out. But of course, it's the devil's in the details, and this is not detailed enough to be super helpful. So that's why those triage teams are there. The other thing that's interesting about this is in the notion of, under the notion of equality, um, people sort of thought triage teams would know no personal information would be shared by, by the triage team, and only clinical data would be shared. So social worth criteria would not be used to determine allocation of resources if you didn't know if the person was, what kind of occupation they had or, or their income level or their race, we might be better able to allocate fairly without bias. However, my, some of my colleagues have questioned that. So that makes sense if you're looking at it from equality, but not, or yeah, from equality, but not from equity. From equity, some of my, so a colleague of mine, Neka Saderstrom, a black bioethicist has said, look, you have two people who come in, they're both really sick. One has a comorbidity, one doesn't. The person with the comorbidity is black. You now give that ICU bed to the white person because there's not as much comor, there, there isn't the same uh, comorbid um, issues. And so now, a, a little bit later, the triage team takes a look because they're blinded to all this information. They take a look to see how fairly they've allocated and they note, hey, we haven't actually allocated to very many people of color, but it's too late to do anything about it. So the question becomes for some communities, knowing their, their his, the historical racism that they've suffer, suffered that has put them at a disadvantage in terms of a access to healthcare should be known by triage teams in order to compensate for injustices that we, they have been um, suffering for so long. So this is an interesting issue, right, ethically. So I'm now to the point where I've sort of go, gone over the big picture stuff. I have 
a little case here for us to look at together if we'd like, or we can stop and we can talk about whatever questions you all have um, or issues that are coming up in ortho and sports medicine that maybe I haven't touched on. So thank you so much for listening to me here early in the morning. And so now we'll open it up. So um, Denise, if, if we have enough time, would you like to go through this case? Um, it is totally up to you guys. We can, is this, does this seem compelling to you to think about? Uh, the, the talk so far has been compelling. Um, so um, we do have time, we'll have time, I think, to go through this and also um, have questions. Okay, great. So let's think about this. Let's just take a look at this slide. Um, I'll give you a second. Now I have, to, I'm just trying to see this chat, which I can't see right now, so hold on. Okay. So there are two ways to look at this. One is, what are you gonna do? You're the, you're the physician in this circumstance. Are you going to even request the blood at all? Or are you gonna make a decision that says, under these extraordinary circumstances, I, I don't think it's appropriate to even proceed? Or are you gonna move it to the triage team? And if so, what do you think the triage team should say? Yes or no? So I'd, I'd love to just have a discussion about this now. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to participate in the chat. What do you think? Do we know if it's likely to be a, a short-term or a long-term crisis in the blood in the blood supply? Yeah, good question. Probably not. We don't know. This is Howard. I, I, I one one thing I would ask is um, we don't know anything about the patient's preferences here. You know, do they have advanced directives? Um, how much are they suffering from their um, underlying cancer? Great, great point. So we will assume here that they would have been e excluded from even consideration if they had been very clear that, I, you know, I want to be no code, I'm switch switching to comfort care, I don't want to proceed under these circumstances, or I don't want to get blood products under these circumstances. Um, it's still a, a palliative procedure, but it's not necessarily a, like a hospice sort of based pr procedure, right? And I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this circumstance. So, so the, let's assume that the patient wants this because it may make him feel better, even though he knows he's dying. This is Dr. Henley. Any chance that this person also may be responsive to EPO? So great, great. So the first question is, are there alternatives? So what do you guys think? Could he be? Usually that takes, um, you know, some time to um, take effect and it, it's more potent, the healthier the patient. So it's, I think it's plus or minus um, in this situation that that would be an effective um, alternative. But it's such a great question because yeah. it says, do we have an obligation to try that first under these circumstances? Yeah. I think we are obligated to try anything that might work or help the situation that does not worsen a very known limited um, scarcity or, or resource scarcity. Right. So you could just be in and then just advocate for your patient mode, which would make perfect sense. Can I ask how much blood might a patient like this need? I know it's variable, but. Assuming this is treated with an intermediary nail, I would say less than a unit done closed. 
essentially or continuously. Yeah, and I would, I would, um, I would say it's it's actually quite variable. Um, you know, if it's a renal cell carcinoma, for example, or myeloma, it, it could actually be multiple units of blood depending upon you know what the patient's um, starting hematocrit was. Um, so I, I think anywhere from one to you know two to four units, most likely somewhere around a couple of units. Okay. So. Let's it say. also it also raises a question of if the patient's going to need blood for other reasons because they're pancytopenic over the next few months, yeah. that you almost you you almost you put them at some risk too if you're using their rare you know their blood type and there's not much blood available to fix the fracture and then the next day they have a GI bleed, will they be, will they have any blood for them too? Wow, what a great question! Yeah. Um, so th these are all kind of related in such a way that you've got to be working with whomever else, the other clinicians, to try to figure out what really the long-term picture for him six months, what the long-term picture looks like for him. Um, would the answer to those questions change what you wanted to do? Would you actually say, even though maybe I only need a unit of blood, and that would be reasonable, let's say, to ask for that, I don't think we should proceed because I anticipate that this patient will need a bunch of other blood for other things after this. A different question is, would it, would it matter um, whether this patient were 85 years old versus a patient who was 35 years old? Great question. Great question. I think they're physiologically the same age. Hey, so Greg Schmally here. I'm just wondering if, uh, if we're in a crisis mode and no longer feeling that obligation to meet the standard of their care, are there, are there alternative surgical treatments like put an X-fix on that, that might achieve some of the goal, which is delay imminent fracture? If I knew what an X-fix was. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, you're getting to alternatives. I think that's exactly what we have to step through in a case like this. Yeah. So what do you others think about that idea? Well, I, I think it's a good point, and it and um, it even leads to the um, most basic alternative, which would be to say that this person has to spend their time um, in bed or at at most um, in a chair, and hope that you know the the fracture won't occur. Yeah, I would I would lean toward Howard's point just because when we start to go off our our treatment map because we're trying to do the we're trying to do something. Um, the other risks are unknown in the setting because we don't put X fixes on people who have metastatic lesions and or primary lesions in their bone very often. And so his, you know, thinking about bone quality and all the things that could spiral away from that. These are great alternatives to be thinking through, I think, together that we would need your expertise to to figure out what those would be. But these are, I mean. That makes a whole lot of sense if they just have to be in bed or in a chair. I mean, it's not ideal, but it is a good way to step through this. And if the blood shortage then passes, right, you could consider then doing the surgery. Yeah. Great idea. So I felt I learned a lot from this discussion. I hope it was helpful to you guys to think about this case. Are there other ethical issues you are facing that, that you'd like to talk about together? I, um, I, this is Howard. I would like um, others to um, take a stab at that if they have issues. Um, and if not, I, I do have one um, question for Dr. Duzinski. We, we've had, uh, uh, at times today, 72 people um, listening in, which I, I actually think is a record for our Grand Rounds. Um, do any of the 67 people left online have, have a question? <laughs>
Okay, well, um, Denise, thank you. That, that was um, um, excellent. My, my question um, relates to um, the approach our, our uh, UW Medicine took to involving healthcare providers um, um, in care of patients um, after uh, the COVID pandemic um, came to Washington State. And ar around the country, I know some healthcare institutions um, made the decision that their healthcare workers um, who were at higher risk um, for sustaining uh, severe cases of COVID um, would be precluded uh, from at least knowingly taking care of patients that might or, or actually were diagnosed with um, COVID. For example, some institutions said if you were a nurse or physician uh, or APP and over 60 years old, um, you were um, not going to be taking care of these patients. Um, in UW Medicine, um, our leadership actually made an announcement um, that um, we were not going to have that approach and the expectation was that everybody, regardless of um, specialty, um, would be expected to care for these patients. Um, I'll tell you that within our department, we made the decision to do what um, some other healthcare systems did. Um, and anybody um, that um, felt um, they had comorbidities or other reasons, um, perhaps taking care of small children, um, whatever, um, living with older parents, um, we um, very quietly um, took them off the list of people who could be redeployed um, to take care of these patients. And it, it's a really, you know, we've taken an oath, um, as you uh, stated earlier in your, your talk. And so um, um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, on this issue, because it may come up again. Yeah, it's a great question. So again, as all things in ethics in this domain, it's reasonable people will disagree and both approaches are ethically justifiable. I think the, so, so of course the ethic, the, I'll use ethics speak to say why protecting some of your, your staff and your faculty makes sense because they're at greater vulnerability to complications from the disease and there is some um, through loyalty and, and care, there's some obligation to protect those groups. It, it can also be justified insofar as you say, are we potentially protecting the workforce by doing this, right? So as let's say those of you who don't have those comorbidities are taking care of patients and maybe some of you get sick, for example, would then you have some people who might be able to step in even temporarily provided there's really good PPE and um, be able to help depending on how sick they are or what risk group they're in, for example. So there are a couple of, there are a lot of reasons to do it that way. I will say though that that approach really kind of keeps us under the usual standard of care approach when I com compared the two versus a public health approach. So the justification for not excluding those folks is number one, First and foremost, it only applies if there is really adequate PPE for everyone. And I think that was happening. We were worried about that at the same time. And so it was even harder to say to people, hey, if you, if you have one of these other conditions that puts you at higher risk, good luck. It sounded like, it seemed like that, right? But if you have adequate PPE, even those who are at higher risk should be reasonably protected. Right, so if we use these resources well, that's what they're for. And that allows us to keep the workforce um, moving forward because the concern, especially when it's super scary and new, is that, that members of this workforce, healthcare workforce will simply opt out because they have other obligations, their families, et cetera. These are real concerns, real duties to other, to other people. And so, I can see the ethical justification in, um, for both approaches, um, especially at for the latter approach when you look at it at a system level, but it seems cruel. But a lot of other things under that umbrella seem cruel. 
the, the restricted visitor, visitor policy seems cruel, a bunch of other stuff. So this, I, it's just a reorientation to how we think about everything. Um, and I, I, it sounds to me like that didn't appreciably uh, reduce your workforce then Howard? No, the, va the vast majority of faculty um, volunteered um, to be redeployed um, as necessary. And um, I would say the, the few people, um, I, I didn't ask for um, reasons, but the few people who gave them, um, I felt, um, you know, they were very uh, legitimate reasons. And given, um, as you said, particularly the um, unknowns and the shortage of uh, PPE at the time, um, it, it just still makes um, sense to me um, to not put those people um, at risk. And, and of course, I, I think, you know, as, as um, the situation evolves, um, you know, perhaps we would look at that um, differently in the future. Um, but, but thank you again. You I think you um, highlighted uh, a lot of issues with it, including things that um, I hadn't um, considered. Tough, tough decisions. Yes, very tough. And everyone has to make them with as much integrity as they can. And that's the thinking through this is a huge part of it. We understand people will disagree about this. this that's what these kind of hard problems are all about, but we have to have good grounding on, on which to stand. And we know that we will disagree with each other to some degree, but if we all have integrity in the way that we approach these things, we can all come through it. Um, and it sounds like that's exactly what happened in your department. Are there, are there any other questions? No. Um, oh, Howard, okay. I have one question. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Um, really briefly, um, you had mentioned the, the discussion about um, keeping personal information out of the discussions from kind of the oversight board. I'm not using the right term. True, but, um, team. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you functionally or practically do that? So if you, you know, if you're taking care of a patient who, you know, is a, a provider at the institution or who, you know, whatever it is that drives the clinical care team to want to, you know, to, to be, to want to intervene. It just seems like it would be very difficult to keep those things actually blinded. You know, blinding is hard enough, like with research right. articles and other things. It seems like in these situations, it would be nearly impossible. So what we would try to do is have basically a liaison between the treating team and the triage team. And that person would collect data from, from the medical record and exclude certain data. And that data would be provided to the triage team. The triage team does not examine the patient, right? They're just looking at the data that's provided and moving forward. So, so that liaison person might make some judgment calls about what to include or not, but we'd be, we would be really clear. Don't include race, don't include profession, don't include gender, don't include blah, blah, blah. Right. And then and then that's the only data that the triage team would go off of as they as they allocate. Let's say there are three people and they're basically equal. We have to make a decision. And that meant nobody at the bedside had to make that decision. Any anybody else? Well, thank you, Denise. That, that was um, wonderful. And again, it's, um, I, I think it's meaningful that we had a bigger turnout um, for a talk that wasn't really directly related to orthopedics um, than I re can recall for um, any of our grand rounds. Um, so, so we um, really appreciate your time uh, and, and insight um, on these issues this morning. Thank you so much for inviting me. I wish I could see your faces, but have a good day. <laughs> yep, you too. Thank you.